Back in 1997, Lincoln arguably started the full-size luxury SUV segment with the very first generation Lincoln Navigator. But in 1999, Cadillac started to steal their thunder with their all-new Escalade, and at this point in time, the Escalade outsells the Navigator by a reasonable margin. But Lincoln hopes to change that with an all-new Navigator for 2018 and an all-new kind of Navigator. Because in the past, the Navigator had been accused of being a very thinly veiled Ford Expedition. But I can honestly say that for this generation of the Navigator, it's quite a different vehicle. Now, obviously, the Navigator and the Expedition are still closely related, but the amount of part sharing has really been minimized with this version. You will not really find any Ford parts on the inside, and the sheet metal is unique to the Navigator as well. This finally is the full-size luxury flagship that the Lincoln brand has been looking for for a while. At 78.8 inches wide, the Navigator is about 3 inches wider than an MKX, now known as the Lincoln Nautilus. So this is a very wide vehicle, even by American standards. We we get standard full LED headlamps up front. These are LED projectors, and they're quite large modules, as you can see right here. We have LED light pipes inside for the daytime running lights, and then the turn signals are actually these strips at the bottom of the bumper. I've turned on that turn signal so you can see what it looks like. We then have LED fog lights below that, active grill shutters to help improve fuel economy, and then a very well-hidden radar cruise control sensor. Radar adaptive cruise control and the autonomous braking system are available in the Navigator, but they're not standard in kind of an unusual twist. I really wish Lincoln would make that technology standard on such a large vehicle. Now you can get it as an option package on the select trim and above. Be sure and let me know what you think about the Navigator's design down there in the comment section below. Some versions of the Navigator in the past I thought were a little bit too demure, a little bit too Ford-like, but this is definitely very bold, very showy, perhaps a little bit flashy. I'd say that overall on the outside, there's just about as much bling going on as a Cadillac Escalade, but I like the overall styling of the Navigator more than the Escalade. As with the Cadillac Escalade, the Navigator is available in two different lengths. The short one is what we're looking at right here, if you can call it short, at 207.4 inches long. There's also a 221.9 inch long extended version if you're looking for a little bit more cargo room in the back. To put the size of the Navigator in perspective, the extended version of this is nearly two feet longer than an Audi Q7, 19 inches longer than a Mercedes-Benz GLS. Although interestingly enough, the long wheelbase version of this is actually a little bit shorter than the long wheelbase Escalade. Out back, we find amber turn signals that you can see on that side of the Navigator. We have a light pipe that runs from one side completely across to the other. And in a nice touch, the glass opens separately from the hatch. I really find this a practical touch, and it's something that we don't see in many utility vehicles in America anymore. You can either open the glass there, or you can actually open the entire hatch with that other button right there. Under the hood, you'll find just one engine in the Navigator, and it's a little bit more European than what you see under the hood of the Escalade. Instead of a large V8, we have a 3.5 liter twin turbo V6. This produces 450 horsepower and 510 pound-feet of torque. Sending the power to the rear wheels or to all four wheels is a brand new 10-speed automatic transmission. Interestingly enough, this 10-speed was co-developed with General Motors, so this is actually the same basic transmission design that you'll see under the hood of General Motors full-size SUVs, although this gets better fuel economy because of that twin-turbo engine. Depending on how you have your Navigator equipped, it could come in at 5,700 to 6,000 pounds of curb weight. Obviously, that has a negative impact on fuel economy, but it does help towing. In terms of overall towing capacity, this comes in a little bit lower than the Ford Expedition on which it is based. 8,100 pounds at the bottom end, 8,700 pounds maximum. That puts the Navigator ahead of the GLS or the Lexus LX570, about the same as the Escalade or the QX80. The front seats in the Navigator are very, very comfortable, even when you compare this to something like the Mercedes-Benz GLS. The model we're driving has 30-way power seats. Now, some of the ways of motion, I think, are just a little bit silly. For instance, the extending thigh cushion, you can adjust the left side and the right side independently of one another. And so far, I haven't really found an actual logical use for that, but it is interesting that these seats offer that feature. These are also heated and ventilated. We have adjustable pedals right here, and we have a four-way adjustable tilt telescopic steering column. As you'd expect out of a vehicle that reaches six figures, the front passenger seat has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, and both seats offer Lincoln's massage feature. Before we move to the back seat, the one thing I should mention about this overall seat design is that the headrest does not move far enough rearward for me. It is a four-way adjustable powered version, but it just doesn't go far enough back. 
Moving to the second row of the Navigator, I'm going to give this 10 out of 10 points because this is among the best in this particular segment, but I'm also going to have to say that this segment overall disappoints me a little bit because these front seats are extremely comfortable. But then when you move to the back seats of a $100,000 vehicle, these are only a little bit more comfortable than what we see in the Expedition. Again, that is not unique to the Navigator because we see exactly the same thing going on in the Infiniti QX80, in the Cadillac Escalade, and actually even the Mercedes-Benz GLS. As you'd expect from a full-size luxury SUV moving all the way over to the right side where this front seat was all the way back in its tracks, I still have a very large amount of legroom left. Before we move to the third row, let's take a quick look at the controls here in the second row. We have our third zone for the climate control system, buttons to open and close the shade on the panoramic moonroof. We then have some charging ports right down there and an AC power port. At the bottom of the center console, we have two cup holders and then we have two more right here in this large center console that the rear passengers get in the seven passenger version. We also have an LCD screen right there showing you the status of the infotainment system. From this angle, you can see how the front seats operate. This is the headrest. This moves in and out and up and down. It's powered. And then the curvature of this seat back does not actually change, although the curvature of the seat front does. So we have this separate section right here, and this actually moves in and out. It's actually a little springy, which is kind of an interesting touch. A nice touch with the Navigator is that both captain seats will tilt and slide forward like this even when a child seat is latched into place. So as long as you have it using those latch anchors and this top tether anchor, not the seat belt, you can actually slide this seat forward like that and get into the third row with the child seat still there. Hopping into the third row, we find a generous amount of legroom and headroom. I can definitely sit upright and I have about an inch of headroom left. I also have about an inch of legroom left even though the second row seat is slid all the way back in its tracks. Moving to the third row, you will definitely see one of the big differences between this and the Escalade because we get more room back here in the third row. The Navigator has a wheelbase that is 6.5 inches longer than the short Escalade and that allows us to have 9.1 inches combined more legroom in this vehicle. That's front row plus second row plus third row. That's a pretty huge amount. Now it's worth noting that if you get the stretched version of the Navigator, they don't actually rearrange the seats, but they do in the Escalade. That's why if you look at the long version of the Escalade, you'll actually find one inch more legroom than this vehicle, even though the short wheelbase version is quite a bit smaller than what we see here. Cargo capacity is another area where the Cadillac and the Lincoln split a little bit. The base version of the Navigator beats the base version of the Cadillac, getting 19.3 cubic feet back here in the version we're looking at versus 15.2 in the Caddy. However, if you get the extended Navigator, we get 34.3 cubic feet back here, which is actually less than we find in the extended Cadillac at 39.3. It's because the Cadillac is longer than what we're driving right here. However, both vehicles will swallow 120 cubic feet of cargo if both the second row and the third row are folded flat. Now for that 120 cubic feet, I'm obviously talking about the extended version, not the one we're looking at here, but it is interesting that the Navigator and the Cadillac are so identical in that way. And that's because of the prioritization of overall legroom to cargo room that we see in both vehicles. Moving to the inside, you can see that our model has this large panoramic moonroof, which extends right there to just over the second row passenger's headrests. This is about the same size as a large panoramic moonroof on many three-row crossovers, but you can see there's so much vehicle behind it that it does end up feeling just a little bit smaller than it actually is. The Navigator we're looking at today is a Navigator Black Label, and that means that we have an interior that's a little bit more unique, a little bit more customizable, and with slightly nicer bits than we find in other Lincoln models. We'll talk a little bit more about Black Label in the pricing section, but don't worry, if you want to get a Black Label Lincoln, but you don't want this burgundy interior, there are other colors offered. The upper section of the door is covered in tooled leather, so this does look perforated, but these are actually little tool marks you can see right there. It's been indented to give it that pattern. It's also been stitched together. Then you can see some of the controls for the 30-way seats. There's so many different ways to control these seats that some of it is done through the control screen in the center of the dashboard. We have laser cut speaker grills right there, a lot of real wood trim going on in the middle of the door. Moving over to the dashboard, we have more of that real wood trim. It has a Lincoln logo and sort of little polka dots painted into the wood underneath the lacquer to give a little bit more visual interest. I think it's kind of an interesting touch. We then have more of that tooled leather going on on the dashboard and some stitched leather on the top. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a large center channel speaker, and then we have this touchscreen infotainment system that sits on the dashboard, sort of like a tablet computer. Below that, we have a button to activate the 360 degree camera system or hazard light button, the buttons for the automatic transmission, drive, neutral, reverse, etc. We have our trailer backup control over here. This vehicle does have that option keyless go right over there, and then the integrated trailer brake controller underneath that backup control. 
I wasn't initially going to talk about part sharing in this video because I generally don't in luxury car reviews. However, so many of you on Facebook were asking me about it, I felt I had to say something. I generally don't mind part sharing between luxury vehicles and mainstream vehicles as long as the parts are well designed. And we see a lot of part sharing in a wide variety of different vehicles, Mini and BMW, Audi of course and Volkswagen, and Mercedes still shares some components with certain Chrysler vehicles. I think Cadillac and Lincoln often get unfairly singled out for part sharing. However, that has caused Lincoln to go in kind of a different direction with the 2018 Navigator. You've noticed so far that there is really nothing going on here that is shared with the Ford. We have very different controls here for the climate control system and the infotainment system. And the overall style and shape of this center console is quite different as well. There's actually a space here, so you can actually reach all the way behind that. This sort of floats in the air. We have a compartment under here where you can store your smartphone. We have two USB inputs right there. And there is a wireless charging mat there as well. And then on this side, we have two large cup holders and then a little slot where you could keep your smartphone upright. Behind that, we have a drive mode button, the auto brake hold button, automatic start, stop, enable, disable, parking sense button, autonomous parking if your vehicle is so equipped, and then an electric parking brake. Moving to the center console, we find that same basic design we saw in the back. This opens to reveal a fairly large storage compartment where we get an additional 12 volt power outlet and a single slot optical disc player. Moving over to the driver's side of the Navigator, we find a full LCD instrument cluster. This is quite different than anything we see in the Ford family, and I'm actually a little bit torn as to whether that's a good thing or not, because this display never feels quite as snazzy as what we see in certain Audi vehicles. There's never going to be a moving map display in here. We basically just get what you're seeing right here, along with a trip computer and a few vehicle settings. For instance, if we hit the setup button right there, we can turn on and off the tow haul mode, see what trailers are connected, enable hill descent control. We can also set up the display and we can choose between measurement units, can add the tachometer to the view, etc. If the tachometer isn't added to the view, you'll see that we get our trip computer information over here and then our audio system information over there on the left side. Notoriously difficult to focus on, we do have a crisp and bright heads up display that gives us turn by turn navigation directions, time, clock, gear, speed, and of course our distance to empty. The steering wheel is a three spoke design with this large center spoke down there. We have our infotainment controls over here on the left, track forward, backward, volume, up, down, and mute. Controls for the radar adaptive cruise control right over there. And then on the right side, we have dedicated phone buttons, a button for the heads up display. There's a media access button, a navigation button, system settings button. Those are for that display right in there. You then interact with the display using this toggle, press down to OK, return right there. And then there's a voice command button. On the back of the steering wheel, we have shift paddles down on the left and up on the right. If you were hoping that the Navigator would drive like a more luxurious expedition out on the road, then you will be pleasantly surprised. If you were hoping that this would drive like a luxury vehicle out on the road, then you'll also be pleasantly surprised because the expedition is actually a really good full-size SUV to base a luxury car on. The big difference, of course, between the Expedition and the Navigator is that we get more power out of the Navigator's twin turbo V6. So this has a faster zero to 60 time than that Expedition. And the suspension is tuned a little bit differently. The model that we're driving has the adaptive suspension in it, and that really is noticeable out on the road. In terms of performance, this ran from zero to 60 in 5.9 seconds. That is notably quicker than the Expedition, again, thanks to that extra power. But keep in mind that this is a very heavy SUV. The model that we're driving weighs around 6,200 pounds as we have it equipped. That is nearly 1,000 pounds heavier than a Mercedes-Benz GLS. Now, as I said before, that does pay dividends when it comes to towing because this is going to feel better when towing a heavy trailer out on the road than a Mercedes GLS because it's gonna get pushed around an awful lot less. So in a vehicle like this that has towing as one of its primary missions, Ultra lightweight construction is not necessarily a benefit, although obviously it would have improved the zero to 60 braking times, handling scores, etc. In our braking test, we stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 130 feet, which is fairly respectable. That's because this car does have fairly wide tires on it. When thinking about handling, keep in mind that the competition for the Navigator would be other full-size SUVs. So on the smaller end of things, it would be something like that Mercedes-Benz GLS or perhaps the Lexus LX570, but the true competition for this really lies in something like the Infiniti QX80, the Cadillac Escalade, etc. And in that comparison, this does incredibly well. In terms of handling comparisons, obviously something like the GLS or the Q7 or BMW X5 are going to outhandle this, but they're not going to have the same kind of size. When pitted against its natural competition, this outhandles the Infiniti QX80 and the Cadillac Escalade. 
and definitely the Lexus LX570. The LX570 doesn't really handle that well out on the road. It really is more off-road targeted, and as a result, they have given up a lot of on-road performance. Speaking of off-road vehicles, I suppose you could compare this to something like a full-size Range Rover, although again, keep in mind that even the extended wheelbase Range Rover is not going to be a direct competitor to this. It doesn't seat as many people. That is a two-row vehicle only, even though you can get the extended wheelbase version, and the extended wheelbase Navigator is still notably larger. When it comes to our overall ride score, I'm going to give this model an A. This car does have an adaptive suspension system, and the way that the overall suspension is tuned is definitely on the softer side of things. This is very comfortable for long highway journeys. Some might accuse this of being a little bit too floaty boaty, but I kind of appreciate the more classic Lincoln tuning that we find in this vehicle. Some of Lincoln's latest models have been attempting to chase performance, and as a result, that classic soft Lincoln ride has been given up. Now keep in mind that this vehicle will ride a little bit differently still, if you have two people in it or if you have all eight people in it because obviously we have a suspension that's designed to accommodate a decent amount of payload so the more people and more things you put in this the softer it's going to ride even with the adaptive suspension system in our cabin noise test we scored 68 decibels at 50 miles an hour easily making this one of the quietest entries in this full-size segment this compares very well with entries even like the mercedes-benz gls or the audi q7 or the bmw x5 this is definitely luxury car quiet Additional sound deadening seems to be one of the differences that we see between this and the related Ford Expedition because this is actually a little bit quieter out on the highway. Depending on how you want to look at fuel economy, I suppose you could call the Navigator's fuel economy abysmal because it has been averaging under 20 miles per gallon, or you could actually call it quite good because for a large SUV like this, we actually get better fuel economy than you'll find in smaller SUVs like the GLS again. Over a week of mixed driving, we had been averaging about 19 miles per gallon in the model that we are driving until we started to tow a trailer. And then we had a trailer attached to this for about 100 miles or so, and that dropped our fuel economy average over the week down to 14.9 miles per gallon. Clearly, your mileage will vary depending on how you're driving the Navigator and exactly what you have attached to the back. Now that trailer wasn't terribly full, but the aerodynamic drag of it really dropped our highway fuel economy especially. If you treat the Navigator gently, it is easy to get over 20 miles per gallon out on the open highway, but obviously if you're doing a lot of stop and go driving or a lot of city driving or a lot of winding mountain road driving like we're on right here, then your fuel economy is going to drop as well. Overall, I have to say that I have been pretty impressed by the Navigator out on the road. This doesn't come across as just a gussied up expedition, even though some will still accuse this of being one. This does feel like a luxury SUV out on the road, and that's exactly what Lincoln needed to deliver. This actually feels more luxurious inside the cabin and while well driving it than something like the Cadillac Escalade, which is a little bit more thinly veiled versus the Navigator when you take a look at its more pedestrian cousins, the Tahoe, the Suburban, etc. Obviously, this won't have the driving dynamics of a unibody luxury crossover like we do see from the European competition. However, that's not the mission of the Navigator. The Navigator, again, is the more truck-based option in this segment. So if you're looking for a luxury vehicle that can do almost 9,000 pounds worth of towing, or if you're looking for the luxury option that can carry eight people and a large dog kennel in the back, then this is definitely going to be a good option for you. As you'd expect out of a flagship vehicle from a luxury brand, the Navigator does not start inexpensively. It starts at $72,055 for the Premier Trim short wheelbase rear wheel drive. If you want to add Lincoln's four wheel drive system, that will set you back about $2,700. It is a fairly expensive upgrade. It's also worth noting that if you want the long wheelbase Navigator, the price jumps up notably to $84,405 because you can't get the long wheelbase in the base Premier trim. As you'd expect out of any luxury vehicle, what we're looking at here on the screen are just the different trim levels. Then on top of those trim levels, there are a decent number of options. Of course, personally, I think there's really only one way to get the Navigator, and that would be the top-end black label version. I realize it is notably more expensive than the base Lincoln Navigator, but I really think that the black label package is exactly what Lincoln should be doing. Black Label is more than just a different trim level for the Lincoln brand. They're experimenting with different ways to purchase your vehicle, so the purchase experience is definitely upgraded versus buying the regular Navigator. The other thing that's different versus buying the regular model is that the Black Label vehicles are divided into three different themes. We have the chalet theme, the destination theme, which is what we were driving this week, and then the yacht club theme, 
which I think is a little bit silly named, but is actually my favorite. We have the light wood inside, the blue leather, and it really, really works very well in person. It looks pretty good in pictures, but I think it looks even better on the dealer lot. Depending on exactly what you want to put in your navigator, you could get the price tag up to over $100,000. So it is important to keep that in mind. But again, we are talking about a full-size luxury SUV, so that price delta between the base navigator trim at $72,055 and about $100,000 is actually narrower than many of the German options. Of all of the competitors, the Escalade is the most similar to the Navigator. We can get one in short form, we can get one in long form. The price tag starts at $74,695, so quite close to the base Navigator, and it ends in a very similar place right around $100,000. We have 420 horsepower out of its V8 engine. We also have, interestingly enough, basically the same 10-speed automatic transmission, and the Escalade is available as either a 7 or an 8 passenger vehicle. Adaptive suspension is standard, as are heated and cooled front row seats and self-parking, so we get a little bit more standard equipment in the base model, although you will pay more for it than the base Navigator. And as you work your way on up the trim level of the Escalade, the value proposition actually starts to get even better. This is kind of a switch in roles for Cadillac and Lincoln, because with the previous version of the Navigator, I think it was the better value. It was also the lower priced vehicle, and now the Escalade takes over as the value option and the option with the lower price tag. But that's not the only way that these two brands have switched positions, because in the past I would also have said that I thought that the Escalade was the better vehicle and the Navigator was the better value, but now it actually is the Navigator that is quite simply the better vehicle. When it comes to comfort, parts quality, build quality, attention to detail, gadgets, gizmos, etc., and just the overall look and feel and design, it's definitely not a tie. The Lincoln is the clear and away winner here. Lincoln really hit it out of the park with the Navigator. Outside the Escalade, the competition becomes a little bit more nebulous. You could compare this to something like the Infiniti QX80, of course, that is Infiniti's large luxury vehicle. The big difference between these two vehicles, of course, is that the Infiniti is not available in extended length form. That means that if you're after that extra cargo capacity, you should definitely not look at the Infiniti. The Infiniti is a good value, however, but on the downside, it is getting old. It was recently refreshed, but it was more of a visual update. They didn't really change anything substantive about the QX80. So we still have the older infotainment and navigation system. We still have the same engine, transmission, etc. under the hood. The QX80 has proved to be very reliable, and I expect that to continue with this new version. The engine is very, very well done, although it is a little on the thirsty side. You'll actually get better fuel economy in the larger versions of the Navigator than in the QX80. When it comes to overall design, I think the QX80 does a good job of being a very blingy, very attractive vehicle, but I think the Navigator beats it there as well. On the downside, the Navigator is notably more expensive, so if you're simply looking for the best value in this segment, I think the QX80 still wins there. Next up, we have the Mercedes-Benz GLS. The GLS is kind of an interesting vehicle to cross shop with the Navigator. As you might have guessed, the GLS has a nicer interior, but the delta between the Navigator and the GLS has never been smaller than it is now. And that's not giving Lincoln a pass at all. That's credit where credit's due. Parts quality is quite competitive in the Lincoln. Fit and finish is very close, and I actually think I like the overall ergonomics of the Lincoln better than the Mercedes. Of course, if you get top-end trims of the Mercedes, then we get nicer materials than you'll find in the Lincoln, but you'll also be paying more for them over there in that GLS. Even though the GLS starts a little bit lower than the Lincoln Navigator, value is actually still a strong selling point for the Lincoln. The GLS 450 may technically start lower, but when you start comparably equipping it, it's going to be about as expensive or perhaps a little bit more expensive. That's of course before you start factoring in things like the GLS being a slightly smaller vehicle and not being quite as capable when it comes to towing either. When it comes to overall performance, the GLS does very well for itself. It has Mercedes brand new 9-speed automatic transmission and their twin turbo V6 engine. And that means that it does go from 0 to 60 about as fast as the Navigator, even though it is actually less powerful. Of course, if you want to go faster than the Navigator, you can definitely do that in the GLS because we have a GLS 550 and, of course, AMG versions of that Mercedes as well, but they're going to cost significantly more than the Lincoln, and they're still going to be a little bit smaller. That moves us along to one of the stalwarts in this segment, the Lexus LX570. The LX570 is, of course, very closely related to the Toyota Land Cruiser, so it has a solid off-road pedigree attached to it. But that off-road pedigree means that the LX570 ends up being a little bit less practical for daily driving and daily commuting than the Navigator. It's definitely not as efficient as the Navigator. Fuel economy is actually going to be worse on daily driving than daily driving in the Navigator with a trailer attached to it, as we recently discovered. But on the flip side, if you want to go off the beaten trail, the Lexus is definitely going to be the solid option there. 
Interestingly enough, the LX570 is actually the second most expensive Lexus available in the United States. It starts at 85,380, but that will only buy you the two row LX570. If you want the three row version, which would be the more appropriate competitor to the Navigator, it actually starts at 90,380. So the Navigator is definitely going to be the better value overall. Because of the overall age of the LX, as well as its off-road focus, the Navigator definitely wins on a number of key areas. It's definitely faster 0-60, to 60, it handles better, it also is more practical for real-world living. That's really noticeable, especially when you start taking a look at the third row and the cargo area. We get more cargo area in the Navigator, and we get a third row that is much more practical. In the LX570, the third row folds forward, and then they fold off to the sides, and that doesn't leave you with as practical of a cargo area as what we see in the Navigator. For the average shopper in America, the Navigator is just going to be the more practical and easier to live with vehicle. Even if you're looking at something for farm or ranch duty, the Navigator is honestly going to be the better option. Because the Land Cruiser may be very capable off-road, but that doesn't necessarily make it that much better when you're talking about uh, wandering across a pasture or perhaps fording a stream, etc. in those regular, more mild ranch or farm duties. Now, if you were to take the Lexus and the Lincoln rock crawling, then it would be a different story. But for most of those heavy-duty uses, again, the Navigator is actually going to be the better option. And that's why the Navigator is my top pick in this segment. I actually think it manages to beat the European options relatively well. It's a better value than the Mercedes-Benz GLS. I like some aspects of the GLS a little bit better. I think it handles just a little bit better than the Navigator. But I think the Navigator is just the better overall SUV. So if you're out there shopping for a luxury vehicle that has more room than the average 3 row option, definitely put the Navigator on your shopping list. Be sure and let me know what you think about it down there in the comment section below. Hit that subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. You can click up there to the top in order to be taken on over to patreon.com so you can support this channel. I hope you want to do that, of course. You can also find us over at facebook.com slash alexandautos to see what we're driving this week, and I'll see you later.